So here is the first question, chapter 19, which is a very good one. In working out these problems, I'm also trying to teach you the theory behind it. That's the goal, okay? So I'll be uh, talking about more than what you see in the problems. So in thermodynamics, a pressure volume diagram is very important. Pressure is always taken on the y-axis. Volume is taken on the x-axis. And if you look at the pressure volume diagram, and if the graph is like horizontal, that means the pressure is constant. If the line is vertical, that means the volume is constant. Remember yesterday we talked about four kinds of thermodynamic processes. Isobaric, where the pressure is constant. Isovolumetric, where the volume is constant. So if I give you a PV diagram, you should be able to easily recognize what kind of process that is. And again, the work done is given by what formula? Work done is given by pressure multiplied by change in volume. That is the simplified version. But if it's, uh, the general formula is integral VI to VF PDV. We looked at that yesterday, didn't we? Therefore, if it's an isovolumetric process where they, there is no change in volume, then you know that there is no work done. If it's an isobaric process, it's easy to find the work because what you got to do is take the final volume, take the initial volume, and take the difference, multiply it with the pressure. So now we have two other processes. They are isothermal process and adiabatic process. So if you look at this problem, you see the problem says, in the PV diagram, the gas does five joules of work when taken along isotherm AB. So that's an isothermal process. And four joules when, when taken along adiabat BC. So you have AB, which is isothermal, BC, it's adiabatic, and you're asked to find the change in internal energy of the gas when it is taken from A to C. So this is a very good conceptual question. In an isothermal process, you know that there is no change in internal energy, no change in temperature, no change in internal energy, which means during the process AB, there is no change in internal energy. And when you come to BC, because it's an adiabatic process, the change in internal energy is equal to the work done. Because the system cannot get any heat from outside and it cannot lose any heat. So if the system, for example, a gas is doing work, then it's using its own internal energy. Therefore, the answer to this question is easy. Can I have the answer, please? From somebody? Negative four. Negative four joules. And I have given you the reasons and this is what you're gonna see, okay? In the video, any questions? So we're not just answering questions. I'm trying to teach you the theory using these questions. That is very important for you to understand, okay? No questions, so remember we got to do at least 15, I think 16 questions, so. Number two. Gold has a molar mass of 197 gram per mole. How many moles of gold are in a 3.37 gram sample of pure gold? And how many atoms are in the sample? That is an easy question, and if you have taken any kind of chemistry, you should know, for example, let me take oxygen as the example. Because students usually make a mistake when I ask them, what's the molar mass of oxygen? Because we are recording this, you got to answer quickly, if at all you're answering. Is it 32? It is 32 grams. Now, it's important to say grams because we never use grams. We always work in kilograms. So don't make that mistake. The molar mass of oxygen is 32 grams. What does that mean? If you have 32 grams of oxygen, you have one mole. 
If you have 64, you have two moles. So how do you find the number of moles? You just take the mass in the sample divided by the molar mass. What is the mass in the sample? The mass in the sample is what? Come on. 3.37 gram. And then you divide it by, you divide the 3.37 by 32. Since both are in grams, you know, it's a ratio now. And you will get the answer. So 3.37 by 197 gives you 0 0.01. Uh, seven one moles. Well, I don't think I've calculated each of these questions. I didn't get the time. Uh, most of them I have, okay? But those that I've not calculated, I will calculate now. Going on to B, I am sure you heard of Avogadro number. Avogadro number is the number of atoms in one mole of anything. And the number is 6.022 times 10 to the power 23. So if you take 32 grams of oxygen, you will have exactly the Avogadro number of molecules in it. That's what it means. This question is asking you how many atoms are in the sample. Now you've got to be careful. It's not asking you how many molecules. That's where you have to think about gold. Gold is monoatomic. Isn't it? So each molecule has one atom, therefore the number of molecules will be equal to the number of atoms. In this case. But if it's oxygen, you write O2, don't you? O2, that means each molecule of oxygen has two atoms. So if you're asked how many atoms are there in one mole of oxygen, you would have to go two times the Avogadro number. I hope you understood that, did you? This one is simple. And so you can just go and find the number of molecules, which is exactly the same as the number of atoms. And when you do the math, you would get 0 0.0171 times the Avogadro number coming up and you get the number of molecules. Are you, uh, you should have enough time to work with me. I know your numbers may be a little different, but you should have enough time. Are you able to do that? Yeah, work with me so you save time. You need that time to uh, prepare for the exam. That's why I sat down for like three hours and did this. Any questions on this second question? Nope. Shall we move on? Very good. Here is number three. A quantity of ideal gas at 11 degrees Celsius and 98 kilopascals. So the temperature is given, but remember, see, it's in the wrong units. Temperature's always got to be in Kelvin. Pressure is again in the wrong units. Kilopascal. We don't use that. We only use pascals. So you have the temperature, you have the pressure and you have the volume. How many moles of gas are present? This is easy. You just have to use the ideal gas equation. I'm sure you know the ideal gas equation. Do you? PV is equal to NRT. Okay, so I changed the uh, temperature to Kelvin. Here is the ideal gas equation. PV is equal to NRT. Where little n is the number of moles. R is the Universal gas constant. That means it's the same constant for all gases. Its value is 8.314. Your textbook uses only 8.31, so I'll stop it right there. So it's simple algebra. We're trying to find the number of moles. You see the 98 times 10 to the power 3 because I've changed kilo into pascals. And you get... 307 moles. So that's the first part. In the second part, it says, if the pressure is now raised to 270 kilopascals and the temperature is raised to 44.0 degrees Celsius, how much volume does the gas occupy? So in the second part, what does not change is the number of moles. 
you have the same number of moles and therefore it's a direct application of the ideal gas equation again. You put in the new pressure, you put in the new volume, the number of moles is the same and you calculate how much volume it's going to occupy. And this is one way of writing it. PI VI by TI is PF VF by TF, where I stands for initial and F for final. And then rearrange that. Rearrange that. To make uh, the final volume the subject. And when you do that and calculate, you're going to get the answer. Of course, there's a little bit of algebra in it, which you should be able to do. I can see that at least some of you are busy writing stuff, trying to do the homework. Knowing that time is very important, okay? To so do what you can. We all don't work at the same speed, and that's why I'm recording this, okay? Uh, I have a sure, go ahead. Where did you get uh, T is equal to 284? 11 degrees Celsius plus 273 because temp. Yeah, got it? Yes, sir. Temperatures always got to be in Kelvin. Remember, whether I'm recording or not, you can always ask questions. Go on, Kian. Was that 98 and uh, the equation would be 98,000? Correct. 98 kilo and 1 kilo is 1,000 pascals. So that's why I put it as 98 times 10 to the power 3. You can put it as 98,000. Same thing. Professor? Yes? That is the universal gas constant. Okay. Yeah. It is the universal gas constant. And I will try to give you all the constants for the final exam. Remember, I may not have to because there's not much calculation involved. You have to know the processes. What do they stand for? What happens? It's uh, checking you for the physics knowledge. Anything else? Any other questions? How did you get the final, uh, final V? I calculated it. Oh, you're not able to see it? Now? Yes, yeah. Yeah. 3.00 meter cube is what you get. And in case you find some of these calculations are wrong, not many, forgive me for that. I try to do it as fast as possible. All right, uh, let's move on to the next one. We're coming to really important questions now. A sample of an ideal gas is taken through the cyclic process A, B, C, A shown in the figure. Now, what is a cyclic or cyclic process? It is if it starts and ends at the same point. So you can see that it starts from A. Look at the direction of the arrows. It goes from A to B. Where the pressure is increasing, the volume is also increasing, isn't it? A to B, come on. B to C, it's an isovolumetric process. The volume is not changing. And C to A, isn't it an isobaric process because the pressure is not changing? Come on. So we have three processes here and together it's a cyclic process. And it says the scale of the vertical axis is set by PB is 8.72 kilopascals and PAC is 6.21 kilopascals. You see those two points? Pressures are given. And at point A, the temperature is 182 Kelvin. First part, we've already done how many moles of gas are in the sample. We can do that. And then what are the temperatures of the gas at point B, the temperature at point C, and the net energy added to the gas is heat. Assume the initial volume at A is 1.25 meter cube and the volume BC is 4.28. So, not so tough. Here we go. We know the number of moles. 
is always mass of the sample divided by the molecular mass. Or, uh, this is one of those that I have not calculated. Or, N can be calculated using PV is equal to RT. Will that work? Take a second, will that work? Do we know the initial pressure? Yes. Do we know the initial volume? Yes. We know the initial temperature. So, will that work? Yes, it will. I have not done the calculations because we will not be able to finish. Okay? But can somebody do it quickly and tell me what you get? Come on. Because I need to slow down too sometimes. So the pressure, initial pressure at AC was 6.21. So 6.21 times 10 to the power 3 times the volume. Initially, the volume was 1.25 in meter cube divided by R, we know is 8.31 times the temperature at A, 182 Kelvin. Who got the answer? 5.13. Uh, 5.13 moles, right? Can somebody second that, please? No? Anybody to second that number? Well, I'll just believe you and go on. Go to the B part. What is the temperature of the gas at point B? How do you find the temperature at point B? Using the ideal gas equation. PA, VA by TA is equal to PB, VB by TB. You know those. Put those in and calculate the temperature at point B. Do the same thing for C. Same thing. And uh, that's why I am not spending too much time on that. And then the last part says, what's the net energy added to the gas? Now, it's very important to notice that because it's a cyclic process, those who are writing, write it down. Because it's a cyclic process, the work done is going to be the heat added, the net heat. It's not always true. It's only true if it's a cyclic process. So Q net is equal to the total work done. How do you find the work from a PV diagram? By finding the area of the PV diagram. Another important point. From the pressure volume diagram, you find the work by finding the area. And in this case, it's easy to find the area because it's a triangle. And the area of a triangle is one and a half times base times height. To get the base, you need to take VBC minus VA. That will give you the base. And then you have the height, which is the pressure difference between B and C. I cannot remember if I did. No, I didn't do it. I just wrote it. The height is A, uh, half AC is the base and the height is BC. And when you do that, you would get the answer. Okay, I assume that the temperature and pressure, the temperature and pressure around the surface of a star. Wow, is that the temperature in a star? How did we find this? I wish I had the time to tell you. We know the temperature of the inner core of the sun and most of the stars. We also know the surface temperature of the sun. And that is a little bit beyond your scope. But it's using the ideas of radiation. It's using how much heat we get on the surface of the earth and then calculating backwards. Didn't we talk about Stefan's law of radiation yesterday? Yes, we did. It's using that law and working backwards and saying, if we get so much on the earth and the sun is that far away, how much would it be radiating from that point? Are you getting the idea? I just gave you the basic principle. So here is the temperature given and the pressure. You notice the pressure is very low. No atmosphere, no air. Look at the pressure. It's 0 0.0453 pascals. What's the pressure on the earth? Anybody knows? 
What's the atmospheric pressure? It's big. It's 101325 pascals. More than 100,000 pascals. Okay, but look at this. The pressure here is so small. And it says calculate, calculate the RMS. Now, RMS stands for root mean square. Root mean square speed of free electrons. Mass of the free electrons is given. Let me tell you what root mean square speed means. If you have, let's say, for simplicity, let's say you have three particles. One particle has a speed of one meter per second. Second one has two meter per second and the third one has three meter per second. What's the average velocity? The average of one, two and three. Two. Now do one thing. Square each one of them, add them. So you get one squared plus two squared plus three squared, which gives you one plus four plus nine, right? Yeah, one plus four plus nine gives you 14 and then divide it by three. And now take the square root of that quantity. See, so do you see that simply taking the mean is not the same as taking the root mean square? Now, do you know how to take the root mean square? Yes, you do. Square each velocity, add them up, divide by the number, take the square root. Wait a minute, is this a joke or what? I mean, we can do that for three particles or seven particles, but can you do that for millions of gas molecules whose velocities are changing continuously? No, you cannot. You cannot theoretically calculate it. That's why we have other formulas. There are mainly two formulas to calculate the root mean square speed and we'll be using both of them. I'll tell you up front, the first one we're going to use is square root 3RT by M. Square root 3RT by M. T is the temperature in Kelvin. M is the molecular mass. The other formula which we'll use down the line is square root 3p by rho. Square root 3p by rho, where rho is the density. I know I'm not writing this because it's coming up. So there are two formulas for finding the root mean square velocity. In this case, we are going to use the first one. Square root 3rt by m. R is the universal gas constant, we know that. But M is M times Na, stop, stop, stop right there. What does that mean? Remember, little n is the number of moles and Na is the Avogadro number. N sub A is the Avogadro number. So if you multiply the number of moles with the mass of one molecule, wouldn't you get the total mass? Yes. Come on. And that would be the molecular mass. So, how do you know it's the molecular mass? Because it's the Avogadro number. We're dealing with one mole. Here is another constant that's coming up. It's called the Boltzmann constant. B-O-L-T-Z-M-A-N-N. Boltzmann constant. Your textbook uses K. I would prefer to use K sub B. Boltzmann constant. I don't know if I used it here. Maybe I write it later, but KB. What is the Boltzmann constant? It is the ratio of the universal gas constant to the Avogadro number. R by Na. If somebody has the time, can you do that quickly and check if you get 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23? Who's going to check that out? It's uh, 8.31 divided by 6.022 times 10 to the 23. You would get 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23. The mass of the electron is given. Oh, wait. The mass of the electron was given as 9.11. I missed one of them. Okay. 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31. No. Oh. And I didn't do the rest. That's why we went to the next question because I know you can do it. Can you work it out now? Hold on, hold on. Kian, uh, hold on, Kian. Do we know the temperature? Do we know the temperature? 
Or is that what we're finding out? What Do we know the temperature? Correct? So 9.13 times 10 to the 7, so root 3 RT, by whatever you get for the mass when you multiply those quantities, okay? Now pressure is given. And you have to find M. That's the problem. Do we know the Avogadro number? Yes. Do we know the mass of one electron? Yes. Can we find the total mass? Yes. So once you get the total mass, can you, uh, what was your question, Kian, now? Go ahead. What is an A? Oh, Avogadro number. Avogadro number. 6.022. 6.022 times 10 to the power 23. So work it out and then you can get the answer. We are going deeper into the chapter now. Into the atomic world, look at this question. It's saying what is the average translational kinetic energy of nitrogen molecules at 1660 Kelvin? Wow, we could even find out the kinetic energy of nitrogen molecules. Why is it saying translational? We are not concerned with the rotational kinetic energy. Because remember that the molecules are not just moving, they are also rotating. So in this question, we are only looking at finding the translational kinetic energy. Translational means straight line, okay? And there is a definite formula for that and it's easy, straightforward. The average, the line shows average, average kinetic energy is three by two kBT. Whoa, oh, where KB is Boltzmann constant. Isn't that so easy? Now you could expect problems like this on the final exam. Isn't that just a multiplication? So KB is 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23 multiplied with the given temperature. You would get the answer. Oh, come on. So... If I put it as 3.436 uh, times here is 23, so negative 20 joules. All right, uh, because it's the kinetic energy of one molecule, it's going to be really small. That's what I get with my numbers. Let's move on. Unless you have a question. Maybe you're not thinking, but I am. Did we use anything specific to nitrogen here? The answer is no. No. What does that mean? Conceptual understanding. All molecules, especially diatomic molecules, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, could be any one of these gases, they would all have the same average kinetic energy. I hope you're writing that down. There are three types of molecules we'll look at, monoatomic, diatomic, and triatomic. So in this case, any other diatomic gas molecule would have the same kinetic energy. All right, here's the next. In a particle accelerator, what's a particle accelerator? Maybe you all heard of uh, nuclear fission, I'm sure, where you need to, uh, you need to have a fast-moving particle that hits a nucleus and then divides it into two or three parts. So how do you get that fast-moving particle? You can't pick it up and throw. We're talking about tiny particles. So that's where you have the particle accelerator, which speeds up the particle before being used in nuclear fission or fusion or whatever nuclear reaction. In this case, it's protons, and they're traveling around a circular path of diameter 29.6 meter in an evacuated chamber whose residual gas is at 261 Kelvin and 1.14 times 10 to the negative six torr pressure. So that's a new unit of pressure. So write down now that one torr is 133 pascals. One tor is 133 pascals. 133. And it says calculate the number of gas molecules per cubic centimeter at this pressure. So you're given the diameter, 
And of course, it has to be an evacuated chamber, like when you're accelerating protons, you can't have other gas molecules there. So all this is underground. You would find it uh, near the Swiss border. That's where all most of the main particle accelerators are. I don't know if you've heard of the Hadron Collider. A few years back, it was in the news. Anyway, so it's a big chamber. Look at that. 30 meters, almost 30 meters. Isn't that huge? And it's underground. It's evacuated. You know, I don't want you to miss the joy of learning this. You know, it's not just about the grade. So the protons are going to move fast, but you've got to find the number of gas molecules. There's a little bit of gas in it. That's why it's called the residual gas. Because complete vacuum is impossible to attain. So there's a little bit of gas. That's why the pressure is so, so small. Did you notice the pressure? Couldn't pull those guys out. They are still there. How do we do this? How do we find the number of gas molecules? It also says per cubic centimeter. Notice that. So the volume is given. Although the volume is in cubic centimeter. Let me ask you this before we go further. Do you know how to change cubic centimeter into cubic meter? Well, to change centimeter into meter, you divide by 100. But to change centimeter cube into meter cube, you have to divide three times by 100 because of the cube. So it'll be 100 times 100 times 100, divide by that. So one centimeter cube is going to be 10 to the power negative six meter cube. Are you able to keep up with me? I'm speaking so fast and so many topics to be covered. But PV is equal to NRT, we know that. And that is the uh, Boltzmann constant coming up, which I'm rearranging. So R is K, B, and A. I'm substituting for R there. So I can put it as KB times NA times T. Okay, so here is an important thing. I let it roll before I stop it. N is the number of moles. Na is the number of molecules in one mole. Did you hear me? You have the number of moles multiplied with the number of molecules in one mole. What are you going to get? You're going to get the total number of molecules. So there are three Ns here, guys. I'm so sorry. Little n is the number of moles. N sub A is the number of molecules in one mole. When you multiply them, what you get is the total number of molecules, which is capsaicin. Okay, the rest is easy to understand. So if you rearrange that, you're going to get N by N over volume is P over KBT. And uh, this I told you already that one tor is 133 pascals. And uh, so I'm changing what's given in Tor into Pascals. I have to multiply with 133. Divide by the Boltzmann constant, which is 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23 times the temperature, which is given as 261. And when you, uh, did I calculate? Yes, I did. When you do that, you get 4.22 times 10 to the power 16 molecules per meter cube. Oh, wait, no, oh, wait, that, that's a mistake. That was per centimeter cube. And then to change it into meter cube, I have to multiply with 10 to the negative six. That's why the 10 to the 16 changed to 10 to the 10. Hold on, I think I'll write it there. One centimeter cube, maybe use red. One centimeter cube is 10 to the negative six meter cube. That's why the 10 to the 16 became 10 to the 10 when we went from centimeter cube to, what's going on? Meter cube, okay. What's the B part? The B part is another concept. 
What is the mean free path of the gas molecules if the molecular diameter is given? What do you mean by mean free path? Now, you know gas molecules are continuously colliding with each other, but in between two collisions, they do travel freely for a very short time, don't they? But would that free path be the same all the time? No, it's utter chaos because you have millions of gas molecules all moving in different directions with different velocities. There is, you cannot say that their free path is the same. That's why we define the mean free path. So what is the mean free path? It's the average distance traveled by a molecule between two collisions. That is the concept. Hope you heard me. The average distance traveled by molecules between two consecutive collisions. You know what this chapter is called? It's called the, kinet uh, the kinetic theory of gases. Now you know why? The kinetic theory, we're looking at it in a, at a molecular level, trying to calculate the energy and all that. So there's a ready-made formula for the, wait, will the mean free path depend on, uh, depend on the diameter of the molecule? How will it depend on it? If it's a bigger molecule, wouldn't the mean free path be less? Because it's bigger, there is more chance of collision. Anybody hearing me? If it's a tiny molecule, then it has more, I mean, less chance of collision. It's tiny, it can just go. So that's why in the formula for mean free path, you have this. I'm not going to ask you to find the mean free path on the exam, but I wanted you to know. So that's the formula for mean free path. Come up. That is the formula. Lambda is the mean free path. If you cannot, I don't think it's so clear there. It's one by square root of two pi. Yeah, that's a pi. D, little d is the diameter. And n is the number of molecules which we already calculated. Actually, we calculated n over v. So what you got to do is whatever you get here, that's what you put in here, just for that part, because we already got the value of n over the volume. And then the diameter is given, but it's given in centimeters, so you'll have to change it into meter. Yes, 19 grams of oxygen is heated at constant atmospheric pressure from 16.9 to 147. So, if you love your life, now listen. Whenever solids and liquids are heated, we never hear words like that. It's unusual. It says, oxygen is heated at constant pressure. When we talk about heating copper, or aluminum, or heating water, we always say it's heated. Which means, gases can be heated under two conditions either at constant pressure or constant volume. Therefore, gases have two specific heats. Gases have two specific heats, specific heat at constant pressure, specific heat at constant volume. And specific heat at constant pressure is always higher. Did you write it down? In fact, the difference between the two specific heats, I can take a new page, let me pick one. For gases, oh, I might have a problem. If I pick that and then it'll overwrite. So I can only use that, or I have to come back to this. Anyway, CP minus CV. C sub P minus C sub V. I could write in a corner hoping that I don't write that. Is equal to R. That's an important relation. The difference between the specific heats of a gas is always equal to the universal gas constant. That's a specific heat at constant pressure. That's a specific heat at constant volume. Oxygen is heated under constant atmospheric pressure from that temperature to that temperature. How many moles of oxygen are present? We know the first part. First part, we've done it so many times. So the first part you do like we have done like 10 times. The number of moles is the total mass divided by the molecular mass. Have you done that? 
Does anybody recognize the second equation? We talked about it yesterday. The quantity of heat is what? Mass times? Specific heat times change in temperature for solids and liquids. But for gases, I mean, that equation could also work for gases, but here is another equation for gases. Q is N times Cp times dt. That's what you're going to use. So from the A part, once you get N, which is the number of moles, and uh, you, you can use Cp and the change in temperature and find that. All right, for all, thank you, for all diatomic gases, Cp will be 7 by 2R, right there. For all diatomic gases, Cp is 7 by 2R. I'm also going to give you this relation, which I had already given you, but I'm giving it to you differently now to show you where we get that 7 by 2R from. Cv is 5 by 2R. And so 5 by 2R plus R gives you 7 by 2R. So I'm also telling you that for all diatomic gases, specificated constant volume is 5 over 2R. Specificated constant pressure is 7 over 2R. Are you with me? Okay, that's only for diatomic gases. And somebody should have asked, what about monoatomic gases? Okay, I'm glad you asked. If it's monoatomic, hopefully I, Cv would be 3 by 2R and Cp would be 5 by 2R. That's how it changes. See that? Just take away R and goes there. And if it's a triatomic, it's going to be 9 over 2R and 7 over 2R. Okay. Uh, but it's enough to know the values for monoatomic and diatomic and the, the d and the b formula what the d on the b formula the t on the b it's dt dt means change in temperature oh delta t also. yes oh delta t correct dt is the change in temperature and so that's why I'm not doing the calculations because you have all those numbers given, haven't you? And you maybe you're doing it by this time. And what's that uh, last part? I need to look at this question again. Uh, what fraction of the heat is used to raise the internal energy of oxygen? So you're giving it heat. You, we got the heat that was given, but now it's asking what fraction is used to raise the internal energy? What does that mean? The first law of thermodynamics yesterday, I'm reminding you, yesterday we saw that when you give anything, a gas, particularly heat, it uses it in two ways. One part is used to increase the internal energy and the second part is used to do work. Isn't it? So that's why this question is asking, if you give it so much heat, what fraction is used to raise the internal energy? So let's go there now. To change the internal energy, look, because it's asking you for a fraction, that's why it's presented as a ratio now. Change in internal energy divided by Q. Notice, the formula for change in internal energy is N Cv dt. And for Q is N Cp dt. Notice the difference, focus here. Do you see the difference? One is Cv, the other is what? Cp. And therefore, the Ns will cancel out, the Dts will cancel out, and you will be left with 5 by 7, of course. And because the R will also cancel out, and you will get 5 by 7, which is 0 0.714. So for all of us, the answer will be the same. The figure shows two paths that may be taken by a gas from an initial state I to a final point F. Okay. Path one consists of an isothermal expansion. So let me draw it as I'm speaking. So maybe till there it's isothermal expansion. And then work is 56 joules in magnitude. 
an adiabatic expansion, which is that. So half of it is isothermal, half of it is adiabatic. And then an isothermal compression, or I change color, so which is this, maybe till there, isothermal compression. You can see that the volume is decreasing now, isn't it? Going back. And then an adiabatic compression, okay. So you have four parts. This is like the Carnot engine. Read from your text. There are two, isothermal exp uh, two isothermals and two adiabatics. This is exactly like that, not perfect, not exactly the same for the last part. Because it says that was one path and the second one is it goes straight from I down that path to F. So do you see the two paths that it could have taken? One, it could have gone across all those four and then the other one. And what's the question? What is the change in the internal energy of the gas if the gas goes from point I to point F along path two? It's a conceptual question. See, this question has numbers, correct? But it doesn't involve a formula. It involves two things. Do you know the meaning of isothermal change? You're asked to find the change in internal energy. We spoke about this before. During an isothermal change, there is no change in internal energy. This is the second time. Look at that. So during the first part, there's no change in internal energy. What did we say about an adiabatic change? Because no heat enters the gas and neither leaves the gas during an adiabatic process, listen up, if the gas is expanding, it has to use its internal energy. But if the gas is compressing, and a gas cannot compress on its own, that means somebody is compressing the gas. So now work is being done on it. What do I mean? When you compress a gas, its internal energy increases. All right, two things. When it's an adiabatic expansion, the internal energy decreases. If it's an adiabatic compression, the internal energy increases. If it's an isothermal change, whether it's an expansion or compression does not matter. There is no change in internal energy. Did I make myself clear now? Okay, if you know that, you should be able to answer this question. You, can, you need not worry about the isothermal. Forget about the isothermal. There is an adiabatic expansion. The internal energy decreases. Adiabatic compression, the internal energy increases. Take those two, get the difference, you have the answer. Air that initially occupies 0.47 meter cube at a gauge pressure. Oh my goodness, gauge pressure. Gauge pressure is not the total pressure. To get the total pressure, you have to add the atmospheric pressure to the gauge pressure. So when the gauge pressure is given as 74 kilopascals, you have to add the atmospheric pressure. Do you know what the atmospheric pressure is? It's about 133 kilopascals. So if you add 133 plus that, that's when you will get the actual pressure, I'm already telling you. So you have the volume, you could get the pressure, and it says it's expanded isothermally to a new pressure, 101.3 kilopascal, and then it's cooled at constant pressure until it reaches its initial volume. Compute the work done. Oh, they've even given you a hint. So there are two things that happen here. Two processes. Number one, it's expanding isothermally. Number two, it's cooled at constant pressure. Do you know how to find the work during an isobaric process, like a constant pressure process? Yes, I told you. To find the work, then what do you do? If the pressure is constant, pressure multiplied by change in volume, that's all. So the second part, we know that's how we're going to do. But the first part, I have not yet given you the formula for finding the work during an isothermal process. It's something like this before I show you. It is little n 
RT natural log V final over V initial. So it depends on the number of moles. Here is the formula. Well, I'm giving you the general formula first. It's integral VI to VF of P dV, you know that. And then you can substitute for pressure from the ideal gas equation, wouldn't pressure be nRT by volume? Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And then the dV goes inside, that's the variable. Does anybody know what you get when you integrate 1 by x dx? Integral 1 by x dx, come on. Natural log of x. Integral 1 by x dx is natural log of x. So that's why that formula becomes nRT. And then the integral there gives you natural log v final by v initial when you put in the upper and the lower limits. Okay, so you have a formula there. When is that formula used? To find the work during an isothermal process. Do we have everything there to work it out? Yes. We have everything there. N is the number of moles. And then if we don't, then we can substitute for RT from the ideal gas equation again. Because we can always use PV is equal to NRT. So I stopped writing there. I'll catch up. And I'm taking that ratio. That's the ideal gas equation. T's cancel. I'm trying to show you that the products will be the same. And it will be equal to, let me stop there. So maybe some don't understand. Let's see. Look, first of all, the product of pressure and volume is NRT, isn't it? Second, I've proved that the product is the same whether you take the initial or the final. So now I'm saying where you have NRT, you could either substitute PIVI or you could substitute PFVF. Show me at least one hand of those who understood. Okay, thank you. So that's what I'm doing. You substitute into that. Pressure, initial pressure is... Yeah, I'm using the exact numbers. Hey, I, would, I may have told you the wrong thing. Did I say 133 kilopascals? Remember, the atmospheric pressure is 101325. 101325. So in kilo, it will be 101.3. Sorry about that. 101.3 plus 74 times uh, 10 to the power 3 because it's kilo. So I get the pressure now. That is the initial pressure. I'm blocking that off. And the final pressure. And that's the final pressure. The atmospheric pressure is the final pressure. Because it says that in the question, isn't it? So now you can substitute all that. And find it. So I didn't calculate that. I just left it there because you have all uh, necessary quantities. You have the initial pressure, the initial volume and that. And the second process I told you, it's an isobaric process and to find the work, what do you do? So once you get the two work, uh, two parts of work, add them and you would get the answer. This, I think, is the answer to the top part. It's not the total work done. I cannot find the total work done because I have not yet calculated this. I just got the second one. So, do you think you can calculate it? Yes. If we, if we try to calculate everything, never going to finish. All right, so here is the next question. It says at 277 Kelvin and 1.12 times 10 to the negative 2 ATM, which is another unit that we never use. You'll have to change it into Pascals. But anyways, the temperature is given, the pressure is given, the density of the gas is given. You have to find the RMS speed. 
Now, this is where, you remember, I told you there are two formulas to calculate the RMS speed. One is square root uh, 3 RT by M. The other is square root 3P by rho. 3 times P by rho. So, here, you also have to find the molar mass, which we can do. This is like the eighth time you're doing this. The molar mass, you can find that out and then use the ideal gas equation. And I'm trying to show you how to go from the first equation to the second. That's what I'm doing now. I've substituted for little n as m by ma. That's what you see there. And then we know that density is mass by volume. So I'm trying to separate the two, I'm trying to separate the mass and the volume. You have the mass, oh, you have the mass there, you have the volume there, just bring the volume to the right side, rearrange the terms, and you're gonna get this formula. But we already know that the RMS velocity or RMS speed could be calculated using square root three RT by M, where M is the molecular mass. And from here, you could make RT the subject, RT by MA, and you would get P by rho, which I substitute into this equation. And that's why you get the second one, square root 3P by rho. So that's the second method of calculating the root mean square speed. I just showed you how to get the second one from the first one, all right? Here, the density is given but isn't it given in gram per centimeter cube? We don't use that. Do you know how to change into kilogram per meter cube? In one step, just multiply by a thousand. To change gram per centimeter cube into kilogram per meter cube, multiply by a thousand. So it's 1.88 times 10 to the negative five. Now I multiplied by a thousand, that's why I have 10 to the negative two. So that's the density, and then the pressure, that's the atmospheric pressure. So you have to convert ATM into Pascals, that's how you do it. You multiply what's given in ATM. I did change the ATM into Pascals, and that's why you have that number there. I was for a second, did I forget? No, I did not. So I did change ATM into Pascals and I put that and I get 425 meter per second. Wow, do gas molecules move so fast? Do you know what that means? 425 meter per second is really fast. And right at this time, as you are seated in your homes or wherever, air molecules are hitting your face at that speed. We don't feel it. If we did, life would have been impossible. If you're gonna just see gas molecules, life would have been impossible. Well, it's after all, you're trying to study about nature. You put it into different boxes. You call it physics, chemistry, and biology, but it's all the same. We're trying to see what this nature is, how our human body is, and we're trying to relate stuff. Okay, so, ah, oh, overwriting. See, that's what happens if I write second time. Uh, the way out is to remove this. Because the software doesn't let me know ahead of time where I've written. Okay. So that's the B part. Uh, in the B part, you're asked to find the molar mass. That's how you do it. Rho RT by P using similar thinking. It's directly from here. This is the part that I'm using to find MA. Volume of an ideal gas is adiabatically reduced. Oh, adiabatically reduced. Ah, so it's an adiabatic process from 178 liters to 78 liters. We don't use liters, so you should know how to change from liters to meter cube. Thousand liters is one meter cube. 
thousand liters. So you got to divide this by thousand each one to get it in meter cube. Anyways, the volume is reduced from that to that. The initial pressure and temperature are given. The final pressure is also given in ATM. And you have to say, is the gas monoatomic, diatomic or polyatomic? What's the final temperature? How many moles are in the gas? So how are we going to find out if the gas is monoatomic, diatomic or polyatomic? I'm having to introduce another quality which is called the ratio of specific heats. Cp and Cv. Do you remember that a gas has two specific heats? And do you remember that Cp is greater than Cv? So if you take the ratio of Cp to Cv, aren't you going to get a number bigger than one? Okay, if it's monoatomic, you're going to get 1.67 for the ratio. Conceptual question, write it down. Monoatomic, ratio of specific heats is 1.67. Diatomic, it's 1.4. Triatomic, it'll be 1.33. Did I give you two, three numbers? So what we're going to do in this problem is we're going to calculate gamma. That's what it's called, gamma. Gamma is the ratio of specific heats. And depending on what we get for gamma, we are going to decide if it's mono, di, or poly. Did you get it? So, here is the formula that we use for an adiabatic process. At least some of you may know that Boyle's Law. Have you heard of Boyle's Law? Sure. And according to Boyle's Law, pressure times volume is a constant. Pressure times volume is a constant. But when it comes to an adiabatic process, look at how it changed. Hopefully, I can write safely here. P, P pressure times volume raised to gamma is a constant. This is the adiabatic equation. So pressure times volume raised to gamma is a constant. Okay. So that's why I've used that. I'm making the final pressure the subject. So I can take the ratio and raise the whole thing to gamma. My idea is to find gamma. Now that's the, um, that is the final pressure. I'm having it in ATM. Because it's a ratio, if I have both the initial and final in consistent units, it doesn't matter. You know that, right? On both sides. So I'm trying to have both in ATM. Did you notice that both are in ATM? 5.08, 1.6. So it doesn't matter. Because it's a ratio. And then the liter is the same thing. Uh, if you change in a meter cube, it'll be okay. But even if you don't change in this particular case, it'll be fine. Again, because it's a ratio. So when you do that and you make gamma the subject. Now to make gamma the subject, you have to take natural log on both sides. Rearrange, take the natural log. You're going to come up with an equation like this. Natural log PF by PI divided by the natural log Vi by Vf. How did I get that? You can look at the two equations and you would know. Now here is Pf by Pi coming up. And here is the initial volume divided by the final volume. Both natural logs. So don't think that you can cancel it out, okay? Please don't do that. And you get 1.4. What did I say? If it's 1.4, what kind of gas is it? Diatomic. So that's how you know it's diatomic. Because it's 1.4. If it is 1.67, it was monoatomic. If it is 1.33, it was triatomic. Did you get it? Now, the B part says, what is the final temperature. To find the final temperature, actually there are three, uh, two ways. Where could I write safely? 
There is one equation, I don't think I've used it, but you could use, maybe I'm safe here, T V raised to gamma minus 1 is a constant. You could use this, or you could just use the ideal gas equation. Remember that the ideal gas equation works for any process. The ideal gas equation works for any process. So, to do the B part, I am using the ideal gas equation. Make TF the subject and calculate. You, I got that number. And then the uh, C part, how many moles? Are, oh, how many times did we do this? How many moles are in the gas? We can get that from the ideal gas equation, straight. PI VI by RT or PF VF by RTF. Either of them will give you the same. And Okay, here's the deal. Now, could we use ATM? It's not a ratio anymore. Now you cannot. See, now you'll have to change it back into Pascal's, which is what I'm doing. And you can see. 1.60 ATM, I multiplied it with that to change it into Pascal's. Same thing with the liters, I did multiply with 10 to the negative 3 to change it into meter cube. And then that's the universal gas constant and temperature has to be in Kelvin. Well, it was given in Kelvin, just saying it has to, got to be in Kelvin and I got 10.2 moles. What 12 gram block, block of copper whose temperature is 337 Kelvin is placed in an insulating box with a 119 gram block of lead whose temperature is 205 Kelvin. Okay, so copper is very hot at 337 and but it's just 12 grams. Lead you have more lead, it's 119 grams, but it's at 205 Kelvin. So here we are mixing a hot object with a cold object. And what's gonna happen is, because it's in an insulating box, they are going to exchange heat with each other. Well, when I say that, you know that the hot object loses heat and the cold object gains heat. But the sum total of both of them, according to the conservation of energy, must be zero. Let me see your hands if you understood. Total change in energy is zero. That's what we're going to use. So first we have to find, part A says, what's the equilibrium temperature? We're going to find. And how are we going to find it? We know that the formula for quantity of heat is mass times specific heat times change in temperature. Do we know that? Yes, that we, that's what we're going to use. So one stands for copper and two stands for lead. That is the heat for copper came up. Mass of copper times specific heat of copper times change in temperature. Remember change is always final takeaway initial. And I had to put initial one, initial two, because they are both at different initial temperatures. Plus, now for lead. Mass of lead times specific heat of lead times change in temperature of lead should add up to zero. But what are we trying to find? TF. Man, TF is in two places, isn't it? Is in TF in two places? So it's a bunch of algebraic steps now where you have to bring TF to one side, which is what I'm doing. I took the terms that have TF, uh, and then here are the remaining terms, and then I have to separate TF, and I will get this formula. trying not to read it because I've been talking for too long. Once you get that formula, could you go in and plug in your numbers 
and get the homework quest. And here, you know, is it okay if I keep it in grams? Yes, because there is a ratio. Can you see a denominator, numerator? So I'm not changing grams into kilograms in this particular case. But if you do, you'll still be okay. You'll still get the same answer. So all those numbers that are given, and when I did it, I got 236 Kelvin. Going on to the B part is, uh, can somebody give the answer? If you have not seen the problem yet, and I mean, if you've taken a couple of chances, you might remember it. But can you just go, what is the change in the internal energy of the two block system? between the initial and the equilibrium state, or rather between the initial and the final state, what is the change in internal energy of the two block system? That's a conceptual question. That is a conceptual question. Did this two block system lose any heat to the outside, to the environment? No. Did they get any heat from the environment? No. What kind of change is this? It's an adiabatic change. In an adiabatic change, what is the change in internal energy? For an isothermal change, the change in internal energy is zero, right? This is not a gas expanding or being compressed, remember? So that's why I'm bringing it carefully. Since there is no exchange of heat, in this case, it is zero. Uh, entropy is abstract. You cannot define entropy. It's like love, pain, hate, all of those abstract nouns, you cannot actually define what entropy is. So that's why uh, those who have taken chemistry would have heard that entropy is a measure of disorder of a system. So that means when heat enters a system, its entropy increases. I'll say that again. When heat enters a system, its entropy increases. If heat leaves the system, its entropy decreases. So there are two or three formulas that you need to know to find the change in entropy. In this case, it's asking what's the change in entropy of the two block system. The only formula that you need to know in this particular case, because it's not a gas, is change in entropy ds or delta s is dq by t. That is the formula you're going to use. That's a basic formula. Now see how we are going to apply it in this case. You got to find the change in entropy of each one individually. Tell me, did the copper gain heat or lose heat? Hello? From my side, I can see it, it did lose heat. So its entropy would have gone up. That means the change in entropy of copper would be positive. But when it comes to lead, because it lost heat, the change in entropy would be negative because it lost heat. So that's how we are going to proceed. So change in entropy, entropy, the symbol is S. So delta S is change in entropy, DS or delta S. And here is another way of finding it. Remember what I gave you was the most basic formula. In this case, you know, wait, let me explain. Don't, you, don't we know that Q is mass times specific heat times change in temperature? So that's why the DQ changed to mass times specific heat times natural log Tf by Ti1. And then for the second one, likewise, M2C2, natural log, Tf by Ti2. So here are the numbers. I'm still using grams. Hmm. 
Okay, change in entropy for the first one plus the change in entropy of the second. You may not see the positive and negative yet, but does anybody see the positive and the negative? Can I, can I ask you please? Do you notice that this is less than one? Take the natural log of that, it's going to become negative. This one is positive. That's how one term becomes positive, the other negative. So anyways, when I did it, I got these numbers. This is for, oh, that's the total change. I didn't write them individually. This is the total change. You get one positive, the other negative, and that will be the total change in entropy. So many years back, you know, a French engineer had this crazy idea. When nothing could move on its own, he came up and his name is Sadie Carnot, C-A-R-N-O-T. That's where we get the word car from and we don't even know that. So this guy came up and said, you know what, I'm going to make something that moves on its own. Well, as usual, people, folk, you know, they just laughed, scorned him and he just gave up for some days, then he actually went back and started working on it and aren't we glad he did that's where we got the blueprint for the engine from what is a heat engine a heat engine changes heat energy into mechanical energy that's where uh, thermodynamics actually becomes so useful now when you get into heat engines and refrigerators which i'm talking about now so what does a heat engine do it takes heat converts it into work and that's how we get to school or to the supermarket or wherever you want to go, all those places. But what is the basic heat engine? It has three parts. Number one, there must be a source. Remember conceptual? <laughs> it has a source. What is a source? A source is from where you can get a lot of heat. And what is the sink? So source and the sink. Well, the sink is the place where you throw the waste into. So the sink is where you reject the heat. So when I say you, we need something that can take the heat, use a part of it to do work, and reject what's remaining to the sink. I just told you how a heat engine works. Did you hear me? And what is that something? Yeah, no, heat sink is different from this. But you may, you know, heat sink is any place where you throw away the heat. So that way, yes, we could call this a heat sink too. But heat sink is usually used in electronics, Brendan, you know, where, you know, you want to keep the semiconductor devices cold. Anyway, com coming back, good question again. Coming back, you need something called the working substance. And what is the working substance? An ideal gas. Does an ideal gas exist, Mr. Carnot? No. So Carnot's engine is a theoretical engine. It's just a dream. It's on paper. Our own James Watt, he said, we don't have an ideal gas, so could we just use steam? And we got the steam engine. A German engineer came up and said, steam engines? Well, the efficiency of the first steam engine was 15%. 15% for every 100 joules, 85 joules was wasted. So this German engineer called Otto said, no, 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 steam engine is no good. And he gave us the gasoline engine, which we drive even today. Another German engineer said, now the gasoline engine has an efficiency of 45%, which is three times that of the steam engine, but still not good enough. You know his name is diesel. Yes, the fuel is also called by his name. And the diesel engine is much bigger than a gasoline engine. And there are many other differences. You can read on that if you want to. I'm not, I don't have the time to go into it. But the first diesel engine itself had an efficiency of 55%. Today we're talking about aircraft engines that have efficiencies touching 92, 95%. Who does all that? Engineers. Where did they begin? Just as you are doing now, in classrooms across the world. Why did they reach there? You hate me for this, but I'll keep going. 
How did they reach there? Why did they reach there? In spite of life, they kept going. In spite of life, when they had the excuses, they kept trying. Look what the world is now because of such people. Well, they are few and widespread, and I'm hoping a few of you, if not all of you, belong to that core group. And it's yours to grab and reach, only yours. This is the end of philosophy, I'm going back into physics. If you're looking for excuses, there's a lot out there. But if you are a person who is like, I'll keep going and do my best and work hard, not shortcut methods. Nobody's reached anywhere with shortcut methods. Even if they reach there, they won't last. They'll come down. So that's the heat engine. Going back, what's the heat engine? Carnot's engine, source, sink, working substance, isn't it? How do we define the efficiency of a heat engine? I hope I have a heat engine question somewhere. Otherwise, I'll keep going until I, oh, there is one there. But I want to give you an idea before we do the last two problems. Here it is. So you have a source, you have a sink, and you have something that can take that and give it out. So this is, I think your textbook calls it T1 and T2. I would have called it TH and TC, but anyways, T1 is the higher temperature because this is the source, this is the sink, and the working substance is here. So what happens is the working substance takes Q1 quantity of heat from the source, it absorbs it, and after it does work, it rejects the remaining Q2 to the sink. So if you were listening to me, you would really simply understand that work done is Q1 minus Q2. For example, if Q1 is 100 joules, that's Q1, and Q2 is 30 joules, then the work done is 100 minus 30 is 70 joules. What is the efficiency of this engine? Okay, efficiency is work over Q1. That's one formula for efficiency. In my example, that would be 70 joules divided by 100 joules. Because the work done was 70 joules and heat taken was 100 joules. So that will give you 0.7 or 70%. That's the efficiency of this engine. And there's another way to calculate the efficiency. That's in terms of temperatures. And it could be T1 minus T2 by T1. You could also calculate the efficiency that way. So if I give you on the final exam a question like this, where I say, one time I did this, it was deadly. I said, Find the efficiency of an engine that works between steam point and ice point. That's all. You wouldn't believe it that some people didn't know what steam point is. Well, what's steam point? 100 degrees Celsius. What is ice point? Zero degrees Celsius. And some students knew this, but this is how they worked it out. Wrong. They worked it out wrong because... They worked it out in Celsius. Am I warning you? Yes, I am. Temperature's got to be in Kelvin. So T1, instead of 100, wouldn't that be 373? You got to add 273 Kelvin, right? 273 to make it into Kelvin, I mean. So minus uh, T2 is zero, but that is 273. So if you do that, do you get something like 0 0.37, 100 by 373, how much is 100 by 373? 100 divided by 373, 0.268, okay, 0 0.27. That was 0 0.27, so that's 27%. So did I give you two formulas to calculate the efficiency? Yes, I did, one, two, and there is one hidden here, three. Those are simple conceptual things that I could ask you and anybody could get it like that, you know. 
It, it doesn't involve calculus, nothing. You just got to know how to calculate the efficiency of an engine. Any questions? No. So let's uh, finish those two problems and then we are on the way. We did this. So we are on this one now. I thought, uh, this one is again where a student spend more time. It's again change in entropy. So, all right. The question goes: A point one two kilogram sample of water is initially ice at negative twenty eight degrees Celsius. What's the sample's entropy change if its temperature is increased to thirty one? Hmm. So initially, ice is at negative twenty eight. Tell me this, as soon as you start giving heat to this block of ice, will it start melting? No, ice will only melt when it reaches zero degrees Celsius. Therefore, first when you start heating it, it will use the heat to increase the temperature from negative 28 to zero. That's process number one. Did you hear me? Process number two. When it reaches zero degrees Celsius, if you continue giving it heat, it will melt. Process number two. Process number three. Now that it has become water, and the water is at zero degrees Celsius, it will undergo a change in temperature to 31 degrees Celsius. Process number three. So to find the change in entropy, you have to find the change in entropy in each one of these three processes and add them up, which is what we're going to do. Process number one, change in entropy. This is the formula, integral dq by t, where dq is, you know, mc dt, so mass and specific heat are constants, so I took them out of the integral. And once again, you're going to get natural log because it's one over t dt. Natural log, T final divided by T initial. That's the formula for that. Yes, and the mass was 0.120, it's in kilograms. Specific heat will be given. But notice something, the specific heat of ice is about half of that of water. See, water is at 4,186. But look at ice, because you're heating ice, it's at 2,220. It's in your textbook. If it's an exam, it'll be given. The final temperature is 273 because it's zero degrees Celsius. And the initial was negative 28. So negative 28 Celsius in Kelvin is a 246, uh, 245? Can't see, too old. Yeah, 245, okay. So when you do that, you would get 28.8 Joule per Kelvin. Also notice the unit of entropy. It's Joule per Kelvin. Any question on that part? This is the part where ice is being heated. Second part is melting. What's the formula for finding the heat required to melt something? Isn't it just mass times latent heat? Therefore, Q now becomes mass times latent heat. Uh, the F there stands for fusion because solid is changing into liquid. So latent heat of fusion, that's, that's why. So there's no integration, nothing there. It's a simple formula. Mass of ice is given and that's the latent heat of fusion of ice which will again be given and the temperature is 273 Kelvin. It's zero degrees Celsius. I did that, I got this. And the third process, we are heating water now, aren't we? Water is being heated, so again we go back to the first formula. But the only difference is, you may have noticed, that this is Ci, specific heat of ice, this is the specific heat of water. Because first you were heating ice, now you're heating water. And you plug in the numbers. 
Well, I used 4,190 instead of 4,187. The answer won't change much, but if it's given, use it. Otherwise, use 4,187, 4,190, it doesn't matter. So I got the change in entropy in the three cases. All increasing, isn't it? Because heat is entering in each case, so entropy is going up. Add them all and you would get the answer. So you would get the answer. We're right on time. Okay, so that's what we get. That's the total change in entropy. That would be 230 Joule per Kelvin. The figure represents a Carnot engine that works, I'll show you the figure in a second, that works between temperatures 425 Kelvin and 155 Kelvin. So you have the higher temperature and the lower temperature and drives a Carnot refrigerator. My goodness, what's a refrigerator? What is the difference between a heat engine and a refrigerator? So simple. In a heat engine, it takes the heat converts it into work and rejects what's remaining. We know that. What does a refrigerator do? It takes the heat from a cold object, but we got to do work on it so it can reject it to a hotter object. So a refrigerator is exactly the opposite of a heat engine. One gives us work, the other we have to do work. How do we do work? Some are like, we don't do any work on the refrigerator, really. Don't you plug it into the power? Yeah, there's a compressor inside. And that's why you try to turn it off, your food is going to go bad. So second law of thermodynamics, look at it, conceptual question. The second law of thermodynamics says, states, there are many statements, this is one of them. It's impossible for a self-acting machine to transfer heat from a cold object to a hot object. What does that mean? If you put a hot object and a cold object in contact, what is the natural direction of flow of heat? Of course, from the hot to the cold. If you want the heat to go from the cold to the hot, according to the second law, you have to do work. That's what happens in a refrigerator. I hope it's clear now. We want that food in the freezer or in the entire refrigerator, depending on the type of refrigerator, to be cold. So we got to continuously take heat from there. The compressor does work and throws it out of the room. And as one time I asked them a question. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you that, but you can imagine what type I could ask. Can you cool a room by keeping the door of the refrigerator open? That was a short question. Can you cool a room? Well, some people just said yes or no. For a short question, you have to give the explanation. The answer is no. You will look like a fool. In fact, you will be a fool. Because now, you made the whole kitchen assuming that the refrigerator is the kitchen. You made the whole kitchen the sink. So it'll take the heat from the sink, which is the kitchen, and throw it back out into the kitchen. What's, you, what's the use of that? So that's why you need to enclose it. Am I making any sense? So you limit the space from where it can take the heat and then throw it out into the room. Of course, the, the kitchen gets hotter when the refrigerator works. Coming back to this question, this is very interesting because here you have both of them together. Here is the diagram. Stop. Here is the diagram. You can see on the left side, you see T1, do you? Do you see T1, T2, and Q1 and Q2? Do you know what they are? I just told you. And then it's coupled to a refrigerator. Look at the direction of the arrows in the case of the refrigerator. It's, it's going from cold to the hot, back up. Here it's going this way. So the refrigerator takes Q4 heat or Q4 joules 
and work is done on it, look at the direction of work. Work is done on it and it rejects Q3 to the source. We are asked to find the ratio of Q3 to Q1. Wow. Q3, where's Q3? It's here. Q1 is here. So there are multiple steps involved. First, talk about the heat engine. Isn't this the formula for efficiency of a heat engine? Work over QH. But I also gave you a second formula, didn't I? So I'm putting those two formulas together. Put them equal to each other. And here is the formula for efficiency. If I were teaching for the first time, I would have made that mistake. For a refrigerator, it's not called the efficiency. Instead, it's called coefficient of performance. You know why? Because this number is more than 100%. When you call something efficiency, it cannot be more than 1 or 100%. But for normal refrigerators, it's about 6, between 6 and 7. So it's called coefficient of performance. The symbol is K. Look at how it's defined. Isn't it the exact opposite for a heat engine? Stop. Look. Compare these two. Do you see the difference? One is work over heat, the other is heat over work. See that? Therefore, there's another formula similar to the one, but again, it's reversed for a refrigerator. It's T4 by T3 minus T4. So from there, I could get Q4 by work, put them equal to each other, just like I did for the other one, and get this. And then if I take the ratio of those two ratios, I'm going to get the answer. All right. But work is also Q1 minus Q2 or Q3 minus Q4. Yes. I did mention that, didn't I? Yep. Work is also Q3 minus Q4. So from there, I could get Q4. Now you can solve in any way you like after you get these two you can solve in any way, but you can even do it without using that intermediate step. If you know where, what you're trying to do after those first two, you can get it. So I took that. And remember that the work done is the same. That's what I'm writing because they are coupled to each other. Wait, don't you see? that the work that this guy is doing on the left side is exactly the work that the guy on the right side is getting. Yeah, they're coupled together. So the work is the same. Since the work is the same, I'm making the work the subject from that formula. This is the one that I use now. You will get that when you watch carefully later on. Because I have to get the ratio Q3 by Q1. You can do it your way. Finally, I've got it. Q3 by Q1.